Welcome to the Indie Nola First Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our prayer is that this message will inspire you, encourage you, and launch you into life-changing action. And today, of course, is Memorial Day Sunday, and originally, Memorial Day was a day set aside to remember those that fought and died in the Civil War. The meaning and purpose have changed quite a bit since then, and now we remember all of those that fought and gave their lives in the service of our country. I appreciate Dennis putting the, the, the battlefield cross here up for us this morning. It's a marker, it's a remembrance. Oftentimes in the battlefield there would be a, uh, there, there's a gun and a helmet and boots a lot of times. They've added things and it's changed over the years, but this is something you'd see from the Civil War, a Civil War hat and a, a sword actually instead of a gun. And uh, as a marker for, for someone who had given their blood for this country's sake and for freedom. And uh, we must remember those that have fought, bled, and died for our freedom. Amen? Amen? It's important to talk about it, to tell your kids the stories that maybe were passed down from your uncles or aunts and maybe your, your parents and I don't know exactly why, but Memorial Day has, has become even more than that. It's expanded even more than that. It's become a holiday that has extended to remembering all of our loved ones that have gone before us. And maybe that's because we all go out to the cemetery or so many go out to the cemetery and make, make sure that the, 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 the graveside is, is cleaned up and there's fresh flowers there and they, they just take this holiday and do that. But it's become really expansive to remember all of our loved ones. We've all experienced the family dynamics. It's been our series for the last five weeks, family dynamics. We've all experienced the family dynamics that are created when a member of our family passes away. It results in major adjustments, changes that we don't want but are suddenly forced upon us. And let's face it, there is no one on this earth who has or will continue in this life forever. Turn to your neighbor and say, you ain't gonna live forever, baby. (laughs) Not here anyway. Not in this life. The symphony of our life on this earth, it has an ending. There will be a finale. And the truth of the matter is, finales can be completely underwhelming or they can be as grand and triumphant as you can imagine. They can leave you with a feeling of, that's it, it's over. Or they can leave you with that feeling of, wow, that moved me, what a symphony. And if we know that finales finales are inevitable, we should anticipate them regardless of whether we are talking about our own finales or our loved ones. And this week, we have certainly been reminded of just how fragile life can be, how a tragedy can just strike out of nowhere and for no reason, and and life is lost senselessly. And it's not always about pure evil, as we have seen in Texas. It can be a bad doctor's report, an unexpected accident. It can be a slowly developing disease. That finale can come in many ways, as you all know and have experienced, but my point is this. When we live our lives with the finales in mind, our life symphonies will be so much more enjoyable and so much more memorable. Colossians 3, 12 through 14, and you're gonna get to know that verse really well this morning because I'm gonna read it. It's the only verse we're gonna talk about today. It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must forgive one another. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And there are some personal realizations that occur when we live in that place that this scripture describes when we live with compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness and patience, when we live in forgiveness, there's some things that become very clear to us. We realize that life is just too short to live in unproductive ways when it comes to our family relationships. 
It's too short not to anticipate the finales. That will certainly change your family dynamics. I think about my dad's finale. and It's something I'm never going to forget. He wasn't a perfect man, but he was a forgiven man. He lived life with a strong personality that was tempered by his passion for Christ. And when his finale came, the room where, he was, where his body laid was completely filled with the Holy Spirit. His wife, his kids, along with their spouses and his grandkids, we were all in the house. We had all gathered to say our see you laters and be with him as he graduated to heaven. It, it really was a magnificent finale. We didn't want it. We had been hopeful for his healing here on earth, but the fact of the matter remained, as much as he loved his family, he was getting a better offer, and he took it. That changed our family dynamic. He was the leader of our family. He was the patriarch of our faith. He was the main breadwinner in his and my mom's home. He was the one we all went to for advice. We leaned on him, and he provided that underlining sense of security in our family that we all benefited from. We may have even crossed the line at times by depending on him a little too much. But my point is, life was going to change whether we wanted it to change or not, and it did change. But my dad had thought, at least in part, about his own finale. He had made the change from living his life for the here and now to living it for eternity. See, our lives are like dots, church. They're like dots on a line. The line goes infinitely in both directions and our time on earth is a mere dot, a speck on that line. And most people live their lives for the dot, everything they do, everything they work for and try to build. Even our emotional states are often wrapped in, up in the way we focus on the here and now. I'm talking about having an eternal perspective, living life for eternity and not just for the dot. Think about it. When your words are spoken through the filter of eternal perspective, you will speak differently to your wife or your husband or your kids, to your mom and dad, to your brothers and sisters, to everyone, especially your family. And when you work long hours and give your all, there's a vast difference between doing it for eternity's sake and doing it just for the here and now. And that doesn't mean being in some kind of full-time ministry. It just means you view what you do through the eyes of eternity. When you live your life with eternity in mind and not just the here and now, you will find yourself making time for family, taking time out of your busy schedule to go out to coffee with that one family member. You will become more intentional about calling your parents or your adult siblings just to talk. One of the best ways to anticipate finales is to live with that kind of eternal perspective. It just absolutely changes how you live when you hold on to that eternal perspective. You see things differently. In our family's case, we had this thing within us as if we all felt a need to rise to the occasion Instead of negative emotions running wild with family fighting and everyone being ultra sensitive and easily offended about everything, there was a calm and a peace during my dad's finale. And as I look back, it was totally God, but it was God using my dad and the way he lived that set the tone for how we all responded to his home going. Nobody fought over his stuff. Everyone wanted to do whatever they could to help mom. Grandkids moved in with her and on and off, and up until this day, there's grandkids living with her, not because she's helpless, but because they just wanted to be there for her, and it allowed her to be there for them. Money is often a big issue in these situations, but all of us kids did our part, whether it was directly giving her money or just taking care of repairs in the house or car or other things that would cost her personally. Lawn mowing, snow removal, all the things that need to be done around the house. And my, my mom was 60 when my dad died. She had a lot of living left to do. And I want to say this loud and clear today. Anticipating those finales, living with an eternal perspective, will practically eliminate the major issues that come up when there's a death. 
Think about it. When you have your eyes focused on eternity, when the people of your family, and you can't control them, I understand that, but you can control you, and you can be a blessing, and you can be that person within your home that is laser focused on the things of eternity, it will change the dynamic when the finale happens, whether yours or someone else's. It's not only about anticipating our own finale, it's about being that person within the family who lives with such eternal perspective that you end up bringing peace and stability to those brutally difficult situations when a family member passes away. And you know, I know grief is gonna happen no matter what, that's just part of it. it that's the nature of dealing with a family member's finale. But it's so different when there has been some thought about that family member's finale. It's amazing how different it is when there's little doubt about where that person's eternity will be spent. And we owe that to our families, to live in a way that leaves little doubt. Colossians 3, 12 through 14, I'm gonna read it in the message version this time. It says, so, chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you, compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, discipline, be even-tempered, content with second place. I love that. I, I, I attribute that to our family conversations where we have to get the last word in. It's okay to be second place. Quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you, and regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Life is too short to live in unforgiveness, church. If there's a family member who has victimized you in any way, don't give them control over your life by holding on to bitterness. Don't live in unforgiveness, which leads to bitterness, and, it, and it is, it, it, bitterness is like a cancerous infestation of your whole life. And as we've said so many times, forgiving someone is not saying what they did was okay, it's just letting them off your hook and putting them on God's hook. Let him deal with them and what they've done. You, you wanna change your family dynamics? Start living in forgiveness. And when the finales come, it's so wonderful to not have to deal with unforgiveness on top of the grief. Saying goodbye or see you later is hard enough without having to deal with the fact that you will never get to ask for forgiveness or verbalize how you have forgiven someone. And I've seen it firsthand, church, when finales occur in the midst of unforgiveness, the dynamics of those families become such that the individual symphonies just get wonky. You know, for, for whatever reason, it seems like I've done my share of funerals since I've been here. I think part of it had to, has had to do with when we, when we came almost 20 years ago, it, it, the church was pretty old. And the church is younger now than it's ever been, and I, I'm thankful for that. Not that I don't like old people, because I love old people. But that first church 20 years ago that I came to, I mean, I can go through the directory, and there's so many of them that I was a part of their burial. I was a part of their funeral, or I did their, their funeral in its entirety. And, and you know, it, it's, it's really interesting from a pastor's perspective when you start seeing how families, how those finales just affect the dynamics in family. And you can be sitting in that room, as I've done with many of you, and, and talk about that person and what they meant to you. And I've been in rooms where there's anger, where there's frustration, where there's unforgiveness and bitterness, and then I've been in rooms where it's just been magnificent. And it's like, let's have a celebration for their home going. But the, 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 the distance between those two, those two things, are, it, it, it's unreal sometimes. Finales will happen, and it's important to anticipate them and live in such a way that that finale can be the best it can be. Life's too short to live in unforgiveness. Who cares who's right in light of eternity? God can sort that out. Do you, you do not need to be the source of all that is true and right within your family in those little petty arguments. And by the way, you don't need to fight with those in your family that, the, that they 
who believe that they are the source of truth. Sometimes you gotta let things go in one ear, not the other. How many have ever heard that before? Let it roll off your back like water off a duck's back. And you have to think, how does what they are saying right now and how does my reacting to it in a negative way, how does that affect eternity for the good? That gets back to eternal perspective. I'm gonna read Colossians 3, 12 through 14. This time I'm gonna read it in the NIV. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Life's too short to live with unforgiveness. I just talked about that, but life's too short to live with an attitude of of offense. And they're closely related sometimes, but they are different. (coughs) We all have and know that one person who causes the most disruption in the dynamics of our family. Right? Okay, close your eyes. You're at a family reunion, and there's one person that just grates you the wrong way. I mean, they're loud, obnoxious, annoying, you fill in the adjective. But they disrupt the harmony of your family dynamics. Can you picture that person? You can open your eyes. We all have that one person. And I'm not saying it's always an in-law, but it's interesting how families can be dynamically functioning fine, then you throw in that person who marries into the family and everything goes crazy, right? And you may be right, the fault may be on a disruptive personality that has suddenly become part of the family, but it could be that they are, healthier, they are the healthier one and their health has actually exposed your dysfunction. My point is, when you start pointing the finger, remember that there's always three pointing back at you, right? Just choose to live in that place that refuses to be offended. Being offended creates family dynamics that wreak havoc and send shock waves across the entire family. Offense just, it sucks the fun out of family holidays and reunions. It, it creates opinions and attitudes and family matters that didn't have anything to do with the original offense. <coughs> and it results in disunified families. Is clinging to your right to be offended really worth it? And of course, I'm not talking about Situations where there has been criminal activities and abuse. These situations require taking some extreme actions, even legal actions against family members, and that's justifiable. I'm talking more about those little things that come up, those little situations that happen that create the bickering and and then blow up into a full-on family feud. (coughs) I gotta get me some water this morning. Sermon's getting dry. Living in that place where you refuse to be offended by all the little stuff, that's having an eternal perspective, and it anticipates the finales in your family. When someone passes away and you aren't holding on to offense, you've just made it easier for yourself. And on the other side of this, quit being so dang offensive all the time, if you're the one. When you pass away, you will make it much easier for your loved ones to move on. Your legacy will be much better if you have chosen to live in a way that is inoffensive. Isn't life all about balance? It's all about walking down that road of balance. Not letting the pendulum swing all the way in this direction or all the way in this direction. Colossians 3, 12 through 14 NLT version says this, since God chose you to be the holy people, to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults within your family. Make allowance for each other's faults. 
and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourself with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. When I think of living with an eternal perspective, I, I always think about living my life free of regret. Why live with regret, especially when it comes to our family relationships? You know, I, I turned 50 a week from this coming Tuesday, and one thing I've realized is that the older I get, the faster life flies by. Am I telling the truth, those of you that are over 50? There is no time, hear me, there is no time to live regretting how we've spent our time on this earth. There is no time regretting how we treat family members. There's no time for that. Life's too short. God put you in a family, and are you putting on love? As the scripture says, as we've read four times already this morning. Putting on love will always move you toward living without regret. I happen to be an avid little house in the prairie watcher. Especially when Alyssa's mom comes to stay with us. It's what Joyce and I do. She enjoys it and I can put off things I need to do to spend time watching Little House with her. It's funny though how quick when that show comes on how quick Alyssa leaves the room and goes and finds some time by herself (laughs) because she's no she knows I'm all in with the little house thing and and Joyce I think there's some anticipating finales in 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 that for me in hers and mine hers in that I don't know how much longer we'll have with her she's in her mid-80s and it's It's time to soak up every moment we can soak up, right? And it anticipates my finale in that I'm sowing what I eventually want to reap. I mean, Joe and Ben are going to be sitting there watching Little House with me when I'm 80. (laughs) Not really what I meant, but... (laughs) You do reap what you sow, right? Right? Maybe when I'm nearing my own finale, my kids or grandkids who know that I've spent time with Joyce will want to spend time with me. You know, there's an old saying that your kids will eventually want to spend time with their own kids more than they want to spend time with you. And that may be truer for some than others, but I I think that has to do with our own investments of time early on. Don't live with regret. Do those things together as a family so that when the finales happen and funerals occur, they can be truly celebrations of life and not just funerals. I remember when I was young and my grandma would call my dad at night. And this was before my dad had given his heart to Christ or maybe it was just right after that. But, But I remember seeing him and how irritated he was when his mom would call him. His dad died at a very early age, and my grandma was widowed for a very long time. Now, my dad was busy, and he didn't want to talk for long periods of time, and grandma would go on and on and on, you know, sometimes how that goes. And she was lonely, and she loved to talk about things that just didn't matter, you know? The leaves are changing on the trees. I mean, you spend 10 minutes on the weather, you do, you know... You go through all these different things. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? You get on the phone and, and I remember seeing my dad become irritated and he'd just be kind of like, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, yep, yep. And he'd just get that look on his face like he was just a little annoyed. And then I remember that, that part of him changing somewhat as he grew in the Lord. And I remember that he was always the first to head on down to help her with seasonal yard work and other chores. And by helping her, I mean that he made my brother and I do it. (laughs) But he was also the first to volunteer to have her live with he and my mom as she became too elderly to live alone. I remember years later, after my grandma had passed away, my dad called me, and I was living here in Iowa at the time, and I was very busy with life and ministry, and I think he was just missing me, and I think, uh, and, and, and he was talking to me about nothing that was really important, just stuff that didn't matter, and I'm like, yeah, 
Mm hmm. Yep. Yep. It's funny how things just reoccur through the generations, isn't it? And I realized how irritated I was. And then I remembered how he used to be and how he changed. And then I listened to him more intently, and I ended up having many good conversations with him about faith, about politics, about just life in general, even about stuff that didn't matter and I didn't care. I cherish those moments now. Finales, you, you, you just can't avoid them, church. They are part of our experience here in this life. And I know that you can't change others. I've said that this morning. But you can change you. You can anticipate finales within your family. When everyone's sitting around and talking about nothing, maybe you go out and play with the kids, even if you don't want to, or you're too tired to. You do it anyway. Maybe you do dishes for, for, the, for someone that's cooking and instead of making them cook and do dishes. I, it, it could be a hundred, it could be a million different things. But when you start thinking about eternal perspective and you think about all the little things you could change to make sure that your legacy lasts a very long time and that your finale is triumphant and not just, womp, 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 you know, kind of that. Just over, underwhelming. Just like nobody notices you're gone even. You start thinking about your finales and how great they can be. It will change you. It'll change your behaviors. Just one person being intentional within your family about those finales, choosing to live with eternal perspective, that, that can change the, the family dynamics across the board. It really can. And if you're living in unforgiveness this morning, it's time to let it go. It ain't worth it. If you're living with an attitude of being easily offended or living in a way that's offensive to those around you, especially family, it's time to make some adjustments. And if you're living with regret, let those regrets go and start fresh today. You know, I believe that God can give us back the years that the canker worm has devoured. So the word says, I believe he can make the time you have left so productive and blessed that it will make up for years lost. You don't have to look and say, well, I've already blown it, so what's the point? That's the kind of God we serve. And this morning, I, I, just, I just want to encourage you. Finales are going to happen. Yours will happen at some point. How are you living to make sure that your finale is going to be magnificent? That's a big question. That's a tough question. Would you bow your heads today? I don't want anybody looking around to this morning. It's not even quite 11 o'clock yet and I'm wrapping it up. But I wanna ask this question. Are you living with unforgiveness towards a family member? And if you are, and you're ready to be done with it, to get them off your hook and put them on God's hook, maybe just for the purpose of your finale. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? No one's looking around. I see a few hands all over. Yeah, there's quite a few, actually. Don't look around. In the name of Jesus, let that go. It ain't worth it. If you have to call them and tell them you forgive them, fine. If you have to write them a letter, fine. If it's someone that maybe passed away already, you can forgive them in your heart and you can forgive them in prayer and in God's presence as you, you seek the Lord. But let that unforgiveness go. It ain't worth it. Is there anyone here this morning that they know that they've, they're living with offense, and that, that's very close to connected. Maybe they're just, they've been so offended. Maybe they've been so easily offended, or maybe you're the offensive one and you know it. 
If that's you, would you just lift up your hand and say, I'm done with this. There's no more time for that. There's no more time for being, having to be right all the time and, and, and push my opinion down people's throats and, and be the loudest person who has their chest pumped up the biggest in the room to try to control. That's really just pride, isn't it? See hands up all over. Okay, you can put those down. Maybe you've lived with regret. And that regret just kind of moves in on you like a dark cloud and it just hangs over you and you just... If that's you, God wants to turn that around today. You don't have to live in regret. You can give it to him. He can forgive you. The past is the past, and you have a bright and glorious future ahead of you because God has a plan, not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future. And if that's you today, you've just been living with regret, you're like, it's too late now. No, it's not too late. It's not. If that's you, would you slip up your hand and say, yeah, I'm done. I'm done living with this regret. See those hands, man. I've never, ever preached a sermon like this before where you take things like unforgiveness, bitterness, offense, and living with regret, and you connect it to finales or to home goings. But I'm telling you, church, your finale does not have to be underwhelming. The finales in your home, in your family, can change if you decide, if one person in your family decides, I'm gonna do everything I can to make these finales wonderful. Maybe you're gonna be the person who brokers the peace between two people that are at odds within your family. Maybe you're the one that lays on your face and just prays for God to move within your family. It, it, Understand, finales are going to happen. And they can be magnificent. God, I pray right now for every person in this room that's raised their hand. I pray for every person, God, that, that feels a sense of responsibility to be Jesus, to be you, every time we're around our family members. God, I pray that you would give us the ability, that you would give us the strength to walk in love, to do as these scriptures that we've read today, God, to live them out. And Lord, I, I, again, I, I, I want to just read this, this, this message version. So chosen by God for this new life of love, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Compassion. God, help us be compassionate. Kindness, humility, quiet strength. Lord, let us be people who are okay with being quiet in your strength. Disciplined even-tempered, content with second place, quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you, and regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It's your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. God, we don't want to be out without love. We don't want to be naked without our garment of love, especially within our family relationships. God, I pray for every family that's represented in this church today every family that's represented by those watching online today. We pray for dynamics to change the ones that need to change. And the ones, God, that you are behind already, Lord, we just ask that you would pour that Holy Spirit gasoline on those and you would just make our families strong and powerful and wonderful in the name of Jesus. We give you our families today, Lord. And we thank you for them as dysfunctional as they are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being a part of the Indianola First podcast. Join us next week to stay updated on our latest messages.